Good morning, everybody. I'm Howard Tierski, and welcome once again to the Winning Digital Customers live cast. Today, I'm going to share with you a magic formula. What's the magic formula for, you ask? Well, it's been a really interesting journey with the series of sessions I've done on the topic of things that are going away. And I've gotten some questions challenging some of my predictions, and I'm going to share with you today the formula that I use to figure it out. So if you're not familiar with these recent other live casts I've done, that's okay. Let me just give a quick recap. So it actually all started with a live cast I did a number of months ago, talking about why my prediction was that over the next decade or more, physical books, paperbacks, hardcovers are likely to largely go away except for rare cases, and be replaced almost exclusively by digital ebooks. And of course, I got a lot of flack for people saying they disagreed with me, or just that they loved their books, and they would hate for something like that to happen. So please don't say that, because it makes them sad. <laughs> but anyway, that led to another uh, series of live casts. Actually, I did two sessions, because it was so many, on 20 things that I believe, that I predict, are going to be going away in the next 20 years, or at least highly marginalized. That, and, and, and of course, you know, we all know that if you look at the world over the last couple of decades, there's a whole bunch of things that have gone away. We no longer use film cameras, telegraphs, stereo systems, Rolodexes, phone booths, yellow pages, typewriters, carbon paper, right? As progress introduces new solutions to the things we need in daily life, some things go by the wayside. New things come in, old things get sunset. And so I gave a prediction of 20 things that I thought were going to be going away. And I got a lot of people arguing with some of those things and a lot of people agreeing, but including in my list of things that I believe that 20 years from now will effectively be the, you know, like today's the VHS tape, right? Somebody somewhere is still using a VHS tape, fine, but generally speaking, they're gone. And that's what I mean when I say going away. So what are some of the things that I listed in those live casts? Fax machines, landlines, TV channels, remote controls, waiting in line, paper tickets, parking meters, physical keys, business cards, printed menus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, I went so far as to suggest that I think there's at least a 60 to 70% chance that by 10 years from now, paper and metal cash will largely have gone away. We will have completely or almost completely replaced it with digital means of commerce, and we will no longer be walking around with wallets carrying digital drive, carrying our driver's license or our insurance card or our credit cards or physical cash. Now, some of these might seem like some big, bold predictions, but you know, 20 years is a long time. Just think, it was 20, the iPhone wasn't even out 20 years ago, and look how much it's changed our lives. So I think it's you know, beneficial to be taking a little time and thinking about what might change over the next 20 years to make those predictions, if you will. Now, now that begs maybe two questions. The first is, why? Why are we even bothering talking about this stuff? And second of all, how are we actually determining this? Because after all, there's a whole bunch of things in our lives today that I don't think are going away. I don't think wrenches are going away. I don't think faucets are going away. I don't think refrigerators or light switches or cars are going away. So there's many things that aren't going away. So how do we figure out which are the ones that are going away? And why do we care about this anyway? So let me talk for a moment about first about how do we figure it out? For example, one of my predictions was lines are going away. The whole idea that human beings need to stand in a row to designate who's next, to designate a sequence that they are to be served, whether it's to buy a ticket or anything else, that idea it will be gone. Now, Usually, when you have something that is going to go away, something what I'm predicting is going to go away, um, we have to stop and ask, well, wait a minute, it serves a purpose, right? There's a reason people stand in line. It's not pointless, which means that it's fulfilling a need. And if it's going to go away, it generally means that something else has to take the place of that need. Now, so many of the things that I predict to be going away in the next 20 years are going to be fulfilled by something digital. In the case of lines, I absolutely think the answer is that digital queuing of one sort or another, combined with self-service, either you won't need to stand in line because you'll just buy your movie ticket on your phone, you know, so there's no need to interact with somebody. Or, for example, at Disney World, where there is a need for queuing because not everyone can get on the roller coaster at the same time, digital queuing, again, using your phone, you schedule an appointment, you come back, you show your, your phone, NFC, QR code, whatever it is, get on the ride when it's your turn, rather than having to stand in line. And so you could say, okay, well, 
standing in line works, right? I mean, we've been doing it for, I don't know, my whole life, but clearly much longer than that. Maybe people have been standing in line for thousands and thousands of years. I don't know actually when people first started standing in line. But in any case, it's been around for a while and it works. So does digital queuing, right? If people have phones, digital queuing works. So what is the basis for having a prediction that the standing in lines are going to be replaced by the digital queuing? I mean, you know, similarly, you know, what would be the reason to think that traditional incandescent light bulbs would be replaced by LED light bulbs? Now, you might argue, well, the LED light bulb is the newer, better version, and the digital queuing is the newer, better version. Yeah, but, you know, other newer, better things have come out that haven't necessarily replaced their pre-existing things. When the Apple Newton came out, they tried like heck to get everyone to replace the physical notebook and start taking notes on the Apple Newton. This was not successful. New Coke, of course, famously came out, tried to replace old Coke. Humongous failure. Um, <coughs> or look at the laser disc. You could argue that, you know, the Newton was kind of an inferior product, wasn't really ready for prime time. But the laser disc came out when VHS uh, tapes were popular. Clearly a superior picture quality, clearly superior audio quality. And yet the adoption of laser discs, and for anyone who doesn't even know what I mean, the laser disc was kind of like a very early version of a DVD. Um, but it came out decades before, and it was a system when you can see from the picture, if you're watching this on video, that they were sort of like DVDs, but the size of a traditional LP. They were quite large, and uh, but they had a movie on them, and the video quality was not nearly as good as DVD, and certainly not as good as HD, but far better than VHS. And yet, they did not take off. And so it's certainly not as simple as saying when something better comes out, it will automatically be adopted. Not at all. There's actually by my formula, seven major variables. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's seven variables that you need to look at when you're trying to answer a question, which would be, is thing A or thing B going to replace thing A, right? A new digital video format has come out. Will it replace the old one? You know, a new type of lawnmower has come out. Well, you know, the Dyson vacuum cleaners came out, a new, or, or take uh, robotic vacuum cleaners. We have one in our house, the, the, the Roomba, and there's a couple of other brands. Are these going to replace traditional vacuum cleaners over the next 10 to 20 years? How do you figure that out? Uh, and, 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 and let me answer a question I asked earlier as well. Why would you want to know that? Well, first of all, let me talk about why. And then I'm going to give you my formula, the magic formula for figuring out whether something new is going to display something pre-existing or not. The reason why you want to know this is several fold. The first is you may need to place a bet. You know, movie studios had to decide if they were going to release their videos, their new movies on Laserdisc or not. If they wanted to release them on Laserdisc, there was some cost in doing that. Many studios did. In many cases, it was not money well spent. So you may have to decide and place a bet whether you're going to invest in or, or move product into some new area. A second reason may be there could be opportunity. You know, if laser discs are going to be the big next thing, maybe I should open a laser disc store. Maybe I should go into a laser disc cleaning business. When something new comes out, very often it creates the needs for new services, and those could be great new opportunities to jump on if that thing is going to be successful. You know, for people who came out with software development companies focused on the Apple Newton and went around to companies trying to convince them that they should build software so they could run their business on the Apple Newton. I don't think those businesses did too well because they bet on something that ultimately did not succeed. So figuring out where it makes sense to go for opportunities, that's the second reason. A third reason is you may need to make your own personal consuming decisions, right? Aside from business, if I'm, if I'm let's say my VHS uh, device breaks and I go to the store and I think, well, okay, I, I should buy a new one. But then the uh, salesperson says, or instead of buying a VHS tape player for your videos, you know, of course I'm rewinding, I pretend it's 1982, right? Um, you should buy the Laserdisc. This is the cool new thing. How often have you been someplace where you're trying to decide, do I want the old kind again, or do I want to go for the next generation or the newer way of doing something? But, you know, again, will it be successful? If your vacuum cleaner breaks, should you not buy a new regular kind and just buy the robotic kind? Um, or is that not something to bet on? So, so, so that's a third reason. And I may mention a few other reasons as we go through, but you know, it can be quite valuable, both from a business and a personal perspective, 
to be able to have, you know, investing is another reason. If you're thinking about putting money into a company and they're focused in some new area or they're focused in an old area, right? I mean, let's say there's a company that makes parking meters. And right now they have contracts with states and cities all over the country to supply and maintain and service parking meters. They take the change out of the parking meters. So every night they, they are a parking meter servicing company. And I have an opportunity to buy stock in that company. Is that a growing business? Um, I had an opportunity to invest in a fund recently. And one of the businesses that uh, was a key investment of the fund was a company that provided, um, like, uh, essentially did catering for corporate events. And I thought to myself, hmm, you know, are corporate events a growing market or are corporate events a declining market? I think with COVID, people are still going to have corporate events, but I think it's declining. And so I didn't invest because I thought, I don't think this is the future. I don't think that this is a growth theory. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm suggesting corporate events are totally going away. But again, it's just an example of why having some insight into what's rising and what's falling can be helpful. So there's a lot of reasons why it's good to know this stuff. But it's tough to figure out because, as I've said, not everything new becomes successful. So here are my seven variables. This is a formula I'm going to give you. The seven things to look at to figure out whether something new is going to displace something old. And this is the process that I went through in coming up with the list. And we'll put links in the uh, description for this video if you're interested in uh, going back and watching these prior videos where I went through why parking meters are going away, why books are going away, why paper forms are going away, why credit cards are going away, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The reason is because when you apply this formula, you can see that that's the direction it's going to be. So. What are the seven components of the formula to figure out what is going away? There are four very rational components. There are three emotional components. And then there's one other component, which I will explain when we get there. So the first rational component is very simple. Is it better, right? Very often, a new product that's better than the pre-existing product has a good chance of being adopted. That's certainly one variable in the equation. As I mentioned earlier, of course, just being better is not necessarily enough to make your new product successful. So, you know, you can invent the wheel. I love this little cartoon, by the way, for those of you that aren't watching on video. Uh, it's, a, it's like a caveman put, pushing a wheelbarrow full of wheels, like he's just invented the wheel. But the wheels of the wheelbarrow are like, old, like square wheels. And of course, he's having a hard time pushing it. So kind of funny. He didn't think to use one of his wheels on his own wheelbarrow. But anyway, <laughs> um, it's not really the point I'm trying to make. I just like this cartoon. In any case, the point I am trying to make is that, uh, of course, if someone comes out with something that just is better quality, a better solution to the problem, you know, if a laser disc it has, a, let me put it a different way, DVDs were a higher quality video format than were uh, of VHS tapes. And so they ultimately wound up being successful. But you know, laser discs were also a higher quality video format and they were not successful. So this proves that this is one of the most obvious of the variables, and, but it also proves that this variable alone is not enough, which is why there's six other variables. You have to put them all together to figure out. So don't make the mistake of thinking just because something's better, it's going to win. But of course, sometimes they do. In fact, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Let me give you another example. Sometimes a new product comes out that's actually worse than the pre-existing product, and yet it still is successful at displacing it. A great example of that is digital cameras. When digital cameras first came out, the quality of the image from a digital camera was nowhere as near as you could get from a film camera. And by the way, when they first came out, they weren't all that popular. But at a certain point, they reached the point where they became more popular than film cameras. And at that point, when they had massively displaced film cameras, it was still true that the image quality and resolution you could get from a digital camera was worse than a film camera. So even though they were worse, not better, they still displaced film cameras. How is that possible? Because there's six other variables. So I guess the main thing I'm saying about better is, I guess it's kind of obvious if something's better, it has more features, it performs more effectively, it's higher quality, and that's an important variable. But as you can see from these examples, sometimes better products don't win. In fact, sometimes even worse products win in terms of their core purpose 
when they're strong in some of these other variables that we're going to talk about next. By the way, today, digital cameras actually are better than most film cameras, uh, but that took a long time. And digital cameras were much more popular than film cameras, even at a point when the technology had not advanced enough that they were superior in terms of image quality. Okay. Uh, so the second category is perhaps also a little bit obvious, but sometimes in a model, there's some parts that are more obvious and sometimes that are less. And having this whole set of items, the seven variables, I think is a powerful tool for you to just go, we need to look at all seven of these things to try to come up with an estimate of, you know, what's the weather forecast, so to speak, for this particular product. The next, next one is cheaper. Uh, products that are cheaper are more appealing than products that are more expensive. So if you have a cheaper solution, uh, that can sometimes displace a pre-existing solution. Or put another way, depending on what the cost is of the new product, it, you know, if someone comes out with a new kind of, let's go back to vacuum cleaners, a new kind of vacuum cleaner, but that's 10 times more expensive than the pre-existing vacuum cleaner, definitely better, but way more expensive. Sometimes products like that don't tank off. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's not only that it's not cheaper, it's more expensive. And I guess these variables kind of tell you who's going to win, right? So cheaper could mean the new one or cheaper could mean the old one. So in this case, maybe we should call this one cost and not cheaper, right? But it's, it's, the point is that if you have a new product, which is much more expensive than the pre-existing way of solving that problem, well, that's a variable that goes against, that's a negative for you uh, in the grand scheme of the formula. But again, there are six other components in the formula. Apple iPhones and even Android smartphones are way more expensive than traditional flip phones, the kinds of phones that they replace. Do you remember in the old days, before everyone had smartphones, the mobile phone carrier would just give you your phone because it wasn't that expensive to get you to sign up for their service. Today, they don't do that anymore because the phones cost $1,000, $1,200, $1,500 because they're, well, they're just much more expensive devices. Of course, they do a lot more. But the point is, sometimes a more expensive solution can displace a less expensive solution, absolutely. Again, this is why we have a formula with seven variables, because no one is predictive on its own. You have to weigh them all together. Let me give you another example about cost, though, that goes the other way. As I mentioned, the iPhone displaced the traditional um, feature phone, I think we used to call them, uh, even though it was much more expensive. The, but let's take another example. When Skype first came out, Skype displaced traditional long distance calling. And when Skype first came out, there was no video, right? So you had an audio only experience and was the quality better or worse than a regular long distance call? Generally speaking, the quality was worse. The reliability was worse than with a traditional long distance call. So you had someone come along and offer a new way of calling your, your friends and loved ones in other parts around the world that was poorer quality than the version that we had had for decades. And yet it took off and it cost the telecommunications industry billions of dollars in lost revenue for long distance. Why? Because it was super cheap. In many cases, it was free or depending on the nature of who you were calling and how you were calling them, they might charge you a penny or two a minute compared to 30 cents, 80 cents, sometimes a dollar, sometimes several dollars a minute to use a traditional landline to make a long distance call. So in that particular case, you had a worse product that succeeded because it was cheaper. So again, as you see, I'm trying to give you these examples to just make the point. First, make sure you understand what each of these seven variables are and to really further drive home the point that uh, you know it's not going to be all about any one variable. That's why we need all seven variables. By the way, another sort of nuance of this whole cheaper thing is the issue of consolidation. What do I mean by consolidation? I mean, sometimes, and consolidation doesn't only apply to, to cheaper, by the way, but sometimes you have a, a product that comes out that's a Swiss army knife. The iPhone would be an example. You know, the iPhone is expensive, but consider all the devices it replaces. It can replace your GPS, your compass, your calculator, you know, your, and sometimes you're even your computer, right? It, so because while you would never spend, I don't think, $1,500 for an iPhone to replace your calculator, which probably costs you $20, in many ways, smartphones have replaced calculators and cameras and GPS devices and other things because it does all of those things. So sometimes something is also perceived to be less expensive, not just on a one-to-one -one basis, 
but rather by saying, well, yeah, it does, it replaces my calculator and it's way more expensive, but because it does so many other things, it can replace a whole pile of things. So bear that in mind. That's, that's the idea of consolidation. And computers, of course, do this as well. Um, and consolidation applies to some of these other categories as well. So I, I may give you another example of that a little later. So the third rational component is when something is easier, it's less work. Oh, you know, it makes me think, I wanna add one more thought about co uh, cost, which is that there's two important categories of costs you have to consider when people weigh the, the, the cost implications of something new. There's the initial cost of buying it, and then there's the ongoing cost. So, you know, for example, when smartphones came out, not only did they charge a, a, a higher price for the phone, but they also charged you more per month for your services because you needed a data plan and a bigger data plan and stuff like that. So you actually had both a higher initial cost and a higher ongoing cost. Electric cars, on the other hand, have a higher initial cost because generally they cost more than gas, gasoline powered cars, but you then have a lower cost on an ongoing basis, both because there's less moving parts. And so at least I'm told they require less maintenance but also because you don't have to buy gasoline and the electricity you use for the car is far less expensive. So again, only one variable, but now you have, again, a different kind of cost equation. So you just want to always think about that. But one critical thing to think about when you think about cost is that if you're trying to see whether product, the new product is going to replace the old product, if people already have the old product, the cost to continue owning it may be zero compared to buying a new product. So if I already have a uh, VHS player and it's working fine and someone comes along and says, well, you know, LaserDisc is higher quality. You should buy a LaserDisc player. It's $800. Well, you know, and let's say my VHS player cost me $500. Well, does that LaserDisc player cost me $300 more? No, it costs me $800 more because no one's buying my old VHS player from me for $500 that I paid for it, right? So you know, there are cases, of course, where you're replacing something. And this is why sometimes it takes time for a new product to displace an old one. Most people aren't going to want to sell their, you know, or get rid of their one-year-old car and replace it with an electric car. On the other hand, if their car is already at the end of its life, then it feels less expensive to buy the new electric car because you're not giving up the value of your old one. So again, this depends on the type of thing you're talking about. But bear that in mind that the incumbent often has the advantage if it has some useful life left. Okay, that's enough about cheaper. Let's move on to easier. So we all know that these days, people like hyper convenience. They like products that are simple and easy. And very often, the easier product will win out. Classic example was um, uh, uh, the iPhone, right? Uh, came out and was easier than, than other products. Um, E-commerce shopping, you know, it's just easier to buy your stuff online in many cases than to get in your car and go to a store. So in many cases, it wins out just on being easier. And just like cost, easier has to be thought about in terms of two time horizons. Is it easier initially? Meaning, is it something you have to learn? You know, it's like some people, is, is there something you have to adapt? Something you have to change? You know, if I want to switch banks, I'm, you know, Chase may have an easier interface than Citibank, but I already know how to use Citibanks. You know, if I'm going to switch to Chase, I've got to learn something new. So you've got maybe an initial level of increased effort to learn something new and then a lowered effort afterwards. So sim similar to cost. And, and, you know, I have a picture here of, of old glass recyclable Coke bottles because, you know, when I was a kid, not to date myself here, uh, you know, when you buy Coca-Cola or other products like that, an orange, orange Fanta or something like that, they'd come in these thick glass bottles and then you'd return them to the grocery store to get your deposit back and they would wash them and reuse them. And, you know, obviously there's some advantages of that over today's approach of, of filling our landfills with plastic. But, you know, it was kind of a pain. It's kind of a pain. You had to save all those Coke bottles. Then you had to remember to bring them back to the store. And so the newer approach, which may be more expensive, which may be less environmental, but that displaced this because it was just plain old easier for people and easier for stores, too. You think they liked having people walk back into their store and having to bring the bottles back and send the bottles back to the bottler. Um, so things that are easier. Are, that's a can be a very important variable. So those are our three. Um, and, and by the way, digital cameras. One of the reasons that digital cameras were so successful is that they were way easier. You didn't have to go buy film, which also reduced your ongoing cost, by the way. So they were cheaper in that regard, even if the camera cost more up front. But also, you could see the image right away on the back of the camera, right? You didn't have to take a roll of film to a photo booth and have them process it and wait for your pictures back and all these kinds of things. So the, the experience of kind of getting to the end, getting to the pictures you wanted uh, was easier. 
And so that's just another example of something that won out largely initially because it was easier, not because it was higher quality and not because it was necessarily initially less expensive. Okay. Um, and the fourth, oh, I think I, I, so there's four sort of rational reasons. The fourth is something removes downsides. So when a pre-existing approach to something has some element of pain associated with it, some negative component to it, and a new solution removes a downside, that is another variable. And a classic example would be electric cars, bad for the environment, cause pollution, electric cars remove that downside. That's a variable that weighs in their favor. So, so those are our four rational reasons. Is it better? Is it cheaper? Uh, uh, is it easier? And does it remove some kind of downside? But as I mentioned, there are uh, seven variables total. So let's keep going. The next variable is, uh, oh, and here's another example of, of removing a downside, right? And, and you know, uh, electric guitar cars seem to be catching on. Obviously, we'll see over time, but I have a feeling that electric guitars, did I say electric guitars? <laughs> electric cars are definitely catching on. Uh, paper straws is another example of a product which is designed to remove a downside, right? Save the turtles, right? Save the landfills, create, use something biodegradable, don't use plastic straws. Now, I'm all for that, uh, but plastic straws are, sorry, paper straws are clearly to most people an inferior product from a pure ability to do the job perspective to plastic straws. They're, they fall apart. I don't know if you've ever tried to drink a drink. We were at the shore all summer and there was a law in the town we were in that they couldn't have plastic straws. So every drink I got was paper straws. And halfway through my lemonade, that straw was usually turning to mush and I couldn't continue to use it. So hopefully people will continue to improve paper straws. But you know, this is an example of something that's removing a downside. But again, that's only one variable. If the other variables aren't good enough, it may or may not be successful. Um, so, okay, so let's talk about some of the more psychologically oriented components. One is just pure resistance, resistance to change. People are naturally hesitant to do something new. At least, you know, there's a small percentage of people, and I think I'm one of those people actually, that loves to try new things. They're the early adopters. But the vast majority of people are like, you know what, I've already got a phone, I already know how to use it, or I've already, you know, I'm, I'm used to this toothpaste, yeah, I hear there's a newer, better toothpaste, but uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm just happy with my toothpaste. You know, you don't even want to hear the rational reasons why something would be better because you just don't want to deal with change. So that's one reason. And that gives a certain, a few points of additional weight to the incumbent. The incumbent is the known. The incumbent is the familiar. So something that is new that's going to displace something has got to be enough better. It can't be equal. It'll lose if it's equal. It has to be enough better to actually overcome that natural resistance that people have, that most people have anyway, to any kind of change. Um, the next is a little different. It's nostalgia. So resistance is just, I don't want to deal with something new. Nostalgia means I love the old. You know, I, I just, it's, it's part of my life. You know, I grew up with it. Um, and I heard a lot of this from people when I talked about the elimination of the printed book. I talked about like, 15 different reasons why ebooks were better, cheaper, easier, all these other variables that I talked about, which is why I concluded that ebooks would be displacing printed books almost completely in the next 20 years. But, you know, I still got a lot of comments from people that said, oh, but I don't know, I love the feel of a book. You know, I, I love the smell of a book. I just feel, well, that emotional connection, and I don't mean to make fun of it, is a real component. Some people just don't want to change because they almost feel the old way is a part of who they are, is a part of their identity. You know, like someone who says, I love my old manual typewriter. I don't want to move to one of these new word processing systems because, I don't know, I just love the feel of something. That's an emotional connection to the old. And, of course, over time, new generations become consumers, and so nostalgia usually doesn't last for forever, but it can slow down the adoption of something if it's the kind of thing people are nostalgic about. You know, people are not nostalgic about, you know, for example, the type of gasoline they use in their car. If a new, better kind of gasoline came out, I don't think too many people would be nostalgic. But other things, things that people engage with personally, uh, they can sometimes feel nostalgic about. Um, and, you know, certainly an interesting example, of this would be LPs. Even though CDs are clearly, and please, if you're an audiophile, don't, don't start with me. But I think by most people's standards, CDs are clearly a superior delivery mechanism. And of course, now we've even transcended CDs to electronic delivery of music, which is so much more convenient. And yet there's a whole subculture of people who love their vinyl LPs. In fact, many new albums that come out are still released on vinyl 
because there's a small segment of people who want to buy them and they're willing to pay a premium for them because they love their vinyl. And without getting into an argument about the technical merits of vinyl, my, my view is that this is 95% uh, nostalgia. And of course, things like classic cars, you know, would you want to drive around in an 80 year old car that doesn't have air conditioning and, and doesn't have most of the modern conveniences in cars today? There's not a lot of rational reasons to do that, except that people are nostalgic. So that's another reason that can slow the adoption of something new. Um, the uh, next is symbolism, symbolism. So symbolism is when something means something beyond itself. And symbolism is actually something that can help something that's new, or it can hinder something that's new. For example, um, if you, you, may, you may be someone who wants to sort of demonstrate to the world, who wants to symbolically show that you're cool, hip, innovative, doing the latest thing. And so you may want to buy the newest iPhone, not even because it's easier, certainly not because it's cheaper, not even because it's better, because let's face it, the latest iPhone theoretically better, you know, in the sense that the chip is faster and the screen is brighter, but on a practical level, it's really going to make a difference in your life because the last one was pretty darn good. For a lot of people, it's just the symbolism of having the newest, coolest thing. And, you know, similarly, you know, you, you, when you get uh, uh, AirPods, right, or similar devices that aren't from Apple, there are certainly downsides. I mean, previously, I never had to charge my headphones until I got AirPods. And, but of course, there are other benefits to AirPods, but there's also a symbol, a cool, a fashion statement of having AirPods. So for some people, that's something that may accelerate the adoption of AirPods. At the same time, there's other people symbolically who want to stick with the old, who, who, who want to be seen as a traditionalist, want to be seen as a purist, and would prefer to be seen with the old and not the new. So that issue of symbolism is another psychological component, another variable to consider. And again, I, you know, I would argue that, that Coke was an example of that. Some people just didn't like the symbolism of a new Coke. They, they, there's a combination of maybe nostalgia and symbolism associated with Coke. Okay, so we've just covered three psychological factors, resistance to change, nostalgia slash loyalty, and symbolism. Um, and the last thing I wanna talk, so, okay, so here's, here's our list. We talked about four more rational reasons. Something's better, it's cheaper, it's easier, it removes downsides, three psychological factors, there's resistance to change, nostalgia, and symbolism. And now I just want to talk about the eighth. Did I say there were seven? Oh, man, I lied. There are eight, eight things, because there's these seven. But then you have to think about these seven, and I'm going to show you a symbol that may, may strike fear into your heart. And if so, I apologize. It's this symbol. For anyone who took calculus in high school, AP calculus like I did, I hated these damn integral symbols. But you may remember the integral says four values, one to n, how do I fulfill this equation? And the point here is that sometimes the value equation varies by use case. Something can be adopted for one thing and not something else. For example, there are certain types of photography that still use film. Very few, but there are certain photographic use cases for which film is still superior to uh, digital, digital photography. Let's look at another example. The Sedgway or Segway or however you say it properly. When that first came out, there was a vision that every pedestrian was going, we were displacing walking, right? Every pedestrian is going to be riding around the streets of cities uh, on the sidewalks using these devices. Jeff Bezos put a lot of money into it. This was considered to be the vision that this was kind of uh, sort of go across all use cases. What happened? Well, it turns out walking is actually hard to displace. And there's a lot of downsides to needing a whole device instead of just walking, even though it gets you there a little faster. But there were certain use cases. You know, famously in, in the movie Mall Cop, and I'm, I'm sure probably in your area as well, you see malls, security guards at malls and other locations do use sedgeways to get around. Also tourists, you see sometimes places you go, there'll be a little like a tourist, see, you know, St. Martin on Sedgeway. So what wound up happening, was that there's just very specific use cases. So for the 100 different use cases that they had in mind, for 98 of them, this formula failed for the segue. Was it better? Maybe. Was it cheaper? Definitely not. Was it easier? Well, it was easier after you learned it because it was super easy to just, you know, easier than walking, in other words. But it was hard to learn how to use it. So it was harder to start using it. Did it remove some downsides? Well, it actually kind of created some downsides because it made sidewalks crowded and things like that. So it was kind of socially problematic. Um, then, uh, you know, obviously some people just didn't like the symbolism. They didn't want to be the jerk who's going around on a sedgeway. So it failed. You can see how this formula could have helped Jeff Bezos save some money, right? Not that we shouldn't feel bad for him. He's got plenty of money. 
But um, you can see how this formula kind of shows you why, yeah, the Sedgway really wasn't set up for success. But there were a few use cases where maybe it really did make sense. So it had modest success, but only in those areas. So there's kind of seven things. I didn't lie, but there's this eighth thing where you need to look at the seven things on a use case by use case basis to really be able to answer it. So, so that's it. We're a little over time, but that's what I wanted to share with you today. I realize it's a little bit complicated, which is why I just started out just telling you what my predictions are to make, to make your life easier so you don't have to deal with all this stuff. But I also realize that you may have some very specific things in your industry that you need to figure out, hey, there's a new manufacturing technique that's been introduced or a new way of disposing of nuclear waste or whatever it is. Is the new one going to displace the old one or not? We need to make some bets. And I would encourage you to use this model to think about um, uh, you know, how to score the likelihood. Now, I haven't really given you a real formula here. I can't tell you exactly on a mathematical level how to factor these in. But I think what you need to do is go through each of these things, figure out how much better is it or, or worse, how much cheaper is it or more expensive, how much easier is it or harder, et cetera. And then we do have, I haven't tried to go over it here, but we do have some mathematical models we've used for this kind of thing to weight these different factors and figure out what the score is to get a sense of likelihood. Because you can never predict anything with absolute certainty. It's like the weather forecast. You know, they can't tell you for certain if it's going to rain unless it's a very extreme situation. You know, there's a giant hurricane coming. For sure it's going to rain. But most of the time it's like, probably going to rain, probably not going to rain. And this is sort of along those same lines. So hopefully this has been a useful model for you. By all means, let me know if you think there's anything missing, anything you'd add. If you have any questions or challenges in applying this, by all means, reach out to me either on direct message or post a comment on LinkedIn or whatever. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, this has been helpful to you. As always, I thank you for watching and listening. And until next time, keep transforming.